We wind. We wind. We wind. <laughs> Welcome to VCR, a Vintage Cinema Rewind. We're bringing old movies to new viewers. I'm Blake. And I'm Mike. And today we're taking on our first Australian film and one of the greatest sequels ever made. Crikey. Mad Ma- <laughs> no, not Crocodile Dundee. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Mad Max 2, also known as The Road Warrior. Also known as a pretty good movie. Yes, it's, I was super excited to do this one. Yeah, I kind of spilled my I kind of spilled my opinion too early, but yeah, it's it's a good movie. Yeah. It's one of my favorites of all time, and you nor Jason has seen it, and so for Accident Adventure, it just kind of made sense. I actually, like, I am aware of the Mad Max movies, but the only one I've seen up until uh, the other day when I watched this movie for this podcast, the only one I'd seen was Fury Road. Which ended up making your top list of last year, so... It did, it did, so that gives me kind of... An interesting relationship with this movie, which we can get into later. Yes, I'm very excited to talk about that. Let's get started with the plot. A very young Mel Gibson plays Max Rokotansky, the road warrior. So he's back from the first movie and traveling in even more desolate uh, hellscape in the Australian outback. and The post-apocalyptic Australian the outback. post-apocalyptic Australian outback, that's right. And... Uh, He's looking for oil, and that's pretty much it, actually. (laughs) He's looking for oil, and he happens to come across the Great Northern Tribe, which is like a group of people that have sort of... They've sort of fortified this oil rig. Yeah. And they are being attacked by this gang called the Marauders, which are being lorded over by a guy named... Lord Humongous. The Humongous. The Humongous. And spoilers, he's humongous. Yeah, he's a pretty big guy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) He's aptly named. So it's honestly, you summed up the plot with that pretty good. So let me just say that Max kind of, he sort of is not really invested in either side, but he wants oil. So he offers to run an errand for the Great Northern Tribe in exchange gas. for gas. Yes. It is all about the gas in this movie. The gasoline. <laughs> yeah. In that like really cool opening uh that really cool opening monologue. What does he say? He's like, you know, Max, he was from another time when the world was powered by the black fuel. In the desert sprouted great cities of pipe and steel. So again, I don't know Dick about the Mad Max franchise, but isn't it kind of established in the first movie that the cause of the apocalypse is everyone running out of oil? Yeah, more or less. We'll talk. You know what? We can maybe talk about this now. We're doing the second movie in a franchise, which is something that we've never done before. And honestly, I don't see us doing this very often, except for very particular cases. And this is one of them. This is a very particular case. Yeah. And, and it's actually a really interesting case because I'm going to be honest with you. The first movie isn't great. That's kind of the consensus that I've heard. So here's the context. The first movie comes out in the 70s. It was made on a $400,000 budget in Australia. Very low budget. A bunch of unknown actors, unknown directors, just unknown period. It's about the Australian society in mid-societal collapse and really Max is a police officer with a family and he's one of the few people trying to hold things together in this chaotic world yeah and sorry go ahead I was just gonna say like isn't like I I know a little bit about the first movie isn't it it's more of almost like a biker movie yeah. As opposed to like an apocalypse movie. It's it's similar to the rest of the Max Mad Max series in which the plot isn't necessarily very deep. It's more about the feeling that the film is trying to get from you and it's okay. often like very like very fast paced visceral kind of feeling. And what I'll say is because of the very very low budget and what they were working with, it almost kind of feels like a low budget prequel to this film Um, (laughs) like a proof of concept yeah exactly it's actually closer in tone and filming to like a grindhouse film like i would say mad max is more similar to a movie like death proof than the rest of the mad max franchise yeah i remember like i haven't seen the first movie but i've seen clips of it on youtube and 
my first reaction was like, wait, what? Like, this yeah. doesn't look like a Mad Max movie. Like, and so what's really interesting about this film series as well, and I actually wanted to ask you this on your first watch and not having seen the first movie, how did you find the opener in, in, in introducing you to this world and the characters and what's going on? Did Do you think that you were able to gather enough from the opening narration to to really feel like you've been pulled into this world at that point in time yeah i mean first of all what a narration like it's yes. so good i forget who the actor is but he does a really good job and like he sort of what i have it pulled up right now what does he say he describes max as well actually i kind of already said it he's like the road warrior the man we called max he was from the other time when the world was powered by black fuel blah 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 and like that's kind of it that's kind of all you need to know about the guy. And, well, like, this, and it also gives this, you like all of these visions of what happened over this time and how the world fell apart as well, yeah. right? Like it's, it's kind of like a, a montage of destruction and chaos and collapse. I assume there's some recycled footage from the first movie yes. there when they talk about his origins. But yep. like, also like I kind of like what this movie and what I assume the next three movies do with Max and that like... Like, he's the central character, but he's almost kind of only tangentially related to what's going on. Yeah. Like, he's very much, it's very much like in the Western tradition of, like, a gunslinger who just rode into town. This movie borrows a lot from the Western genre in in many regards, and I think we'll talk about that in probably more detail throughout this episode and and even in our deep dive episode as well. But if you're a fan of Westerns, you're going to really find something cool here in, in kind of a shift in, in the atmosphere, but while still feeling at home. In a yeah, Western film. definitely. So, and and the other kind of thing going into this is like they do a good job of painting the portrait of Max as a man who's lost, and and in the first one, that's kind of the big pivotal moment of the first film is his wife and young young child are brutally <laughs> murdered by a gang of bikers Ugh. in the film, and they actually show that in in the opening montage. I actually think that the opening montage of Mad Max 2 does a really good job of recontextualizing the first film and actually making the first film make more sense honestly to the whole series but I think as a jumping off point I think Mad Max 2 is a really great spot to start in this series and if you're ever interested in the first Mad Max you can go check it out but it's almost like if you've ever heard of Machete Order for the Star Wars franchise it's almost like what's the first movie called again now I'm blanking Phantom Menace the Phantom Menace it's almost like with Machete Order how it treats the Phantom Menace as a weird prequel that you can just kind of watch on its own without it really adding much to this overall story and lore of the Star Wars universe yeah, well, especially in the context of, like, this movie and even Fury Road, it's like, you don't really need a detailed origin story for a guy named Max. No. Like, if anything, it works. You know, all you really need to know about him is that he's from before the apocalypse and something really bad happened to him. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah, and, yeah. and most of human- his humanity is gone at this point. It's been wiped away, and all that's left is the primal drive to survive. Yeah, the primal drive to survive. Yeah. He's, uh, later on in the movie, one of the characters calls him, like, a maggot feasting on the old world. Right. And I was like, well, maggot's a little strong. But yeah, you're not, you're not totally (laughs) off base here. The only thing that, other thing that I'll say before we kind of move on from this is this film takes place, like, three to five years after the first movie to kind of talk about for continuity yeah okay. for continuity's sake it's it's kind of a little bit of a fluid kind of timeline to the mad max series well, i remember um somebody asked george miller like what like with fury road they're like oh well what's the deal with um who's the actor's name um oh, gibson no the the new max oh tom hardy yeah i think they asked him like well what does this do to continuity and he kind of just shrugged and kind of said well each movie is kind of its own thing yeah so yeah and it's, and that's what's really cool and what i wanted to mention about this is all the films are really independent of one another they don't really reference each other yeah. a ton other than like maybe some opening plot points to like help you understand the character of who max is but it's often like you said it's it's more max kind of moving through other people's stories 
Yeah, and that's really interesting just from mm -hmm. a storytelling perspective. Yeah, and so it's really cool because it's something – and we don't get this much anymore in films because everything has to be a big movie franchise. But these are really cool films in that you can just toss one on at any time and and really get hooked on it. It's like the old Indiana Jones films or the old Batman films where it's like, hey, I'm going to watch The Last Crusade tonight because I feel like watching Nazis trying to find the Holy Grail. Yeah. And like and you don't have to watch the first Indiana Jones movies to check that one out. It's almost like there's probably a parallel universe where every John Wick movie is just John Wick being sent on a new assassination target. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's all you need. Yeah. And yeah. and it's great. I love this kind of old style of movies and movie franchises where you can just kind of fluidly watch movies in whichever order you want you can check them out and it doesn't really affect your viewing experience i did read somewhere that um there was george miller in an early draft of the script was going to have lord humongous turn out to be a character from the first movie right but at the last second someone was like no that's dumb <laughs> <laughs> let's like, try to distance ourselves yeah, as much as possible from the first let's movie let's get it let's not do that yeah i really just i like as a writer myself there's something really interesting about a main character who has no personal investment in what's going on. Right. But is still just kind of here. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's almost kind of like, um, uh, you're going to like this, Kurt Russell in Big Trouble in Little China. Yes. Like, you know, this isn't really his story, but he's just, he's sure participating in it. Yeah. And we're going to do that movie someday at some point, because I have a lot of thoughts on that movie. But you're right. It's similar to that. I will say in Big Trouble in Little China, Kurt Russell's Ooh. character thinks he's the main character when he really isn't. And yeah. that's part of the reason why I love this movie so much. But this movie, Max is definitely the the point in which all things kind of pivot around but it's really the story of the great northern tribe versus the marauders, marauders. yeah and even the gyro captain as well side note cool yeah he actually ever. it's funny the gyro captain <laughs> he always says he actually no i'll say it, he has more character development than the main character yeah he's actually more dynamic the only other thing i'll say about sequels prequels and reboots actually two other things is Again, so Mad Max 2 takes place before the events of Mad Max Fury Road, but you don't have to, again, you really don't have to see one or the other first to, to really get invested in this world and, and the aesthetic of this world and all of the cool stuff happening in this world. They're just really, really fun action movies. Yeah, I mean, you can watch them however you want in any order. Although, well, we'll talk about this in our next part, but like this movie... And Fury Road in particular have a very strange relationship. Yeah. But we'll talk about that later. Sounds good. There is also one other movie in the Mad Max franchise, which I'll just briefly mention. It's Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. It's the third movie in the franchise. It takes place 15 to 18 years after the second movie here. It is considered somewhat subpar to the second movie in Fury Road. Personally, it's a pretty enjoyable movie. It's just there's... The movie takes a very different turn than the rest of the series. About halfway through, it becomes more of a Lost Boys, Peter Pan kind of film. Oh, interesting. And it, it was actually because George Miller wanted to make more of a Lost Boys, Peter Pan kind of film. And then he was like, Just oh, we Mad could Max. set this in the mad max universe um but anyway i like the idea of taking any type of story and just throwing mad max in it <laughs> it's kind of awesome yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah like we could do like a uh, pretty woman but with mad max <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like he's not the romantic lead he's just watching them from a distance <laughs> <laughs> all right characters and people you may know so we've talked about max here played by mel gibson this is the movie and the film series that actually put mel gibson on the map we wouldn't have him for better or worse uh without this film <laughs> he's definitely one of the more controversial modern actors of our time yeah um a lot of, he's done a lot of shitty things has he um, i'm actually not super familiar with I, I read about everything to kind of get a we don't have to get into it. it we don't have to get into it Let, let's just say he's not a great person he's struggled with alcoholism his whole life and sometimes he's saying do things that you shouldn't don't always drink and definitely don't, don't drink and drive. There's that great joke about, um, remember Craig Ferguson had that great bit about how, I guess Mel Gibson said a bunch of anti-Semitic shit and pe he was just like, some her people or he were just like, no, 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 no. It's okay. He's just drunk. And then Craig <laughs> Ferguson was like, 
He's like, I was, rec- he's like, I was a blackout drunk for 15 years. I didn't know you could get that drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, Mel Gibson following this, he's known for a lot of other things, including the lethal weapon series. And then also just being a really good director as well. Like directing Braveheart, Braveheart, Passion of the Christ, Apocalypto, which side note was one of my favorite movies. Of yeah. Last year. You wouldn't stop gushing about it last year. It was year. really goddamn good. And Hawks, Hacksaw Ridge of recent the last five six years yeah it's funny well i shouldn't say funny but like he's definitely he's still around like he's still doing stuff oh yeah he's making movies still yeah it took a while for him to kind of bounce back from the dark dark shit he was saying i remember in a i think it was like what 2014 you and i went and saw the third expendables movie together yep and he plays the villain in that and there's a scene where he's intimidating someone he just says like you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And I was sitting there like, we know. <laughs> we know, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next character who is kind of introduced on the good guy side is the gyro captain. He's got like a, a little helicopter kind of vehicle. It's really cool. What a guy. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting character performed really well by Bruce Spence. Uh, who you may know as Mr. Wall from Dark City, which is a sci-fi movie from the 90s that's a massive cult hit that I personally love as well. He was also in The Return of the King, the extended editions. He was the Black Lieutenant in that, which is really cool, but you would only know if you're a massive Lord of the Rings fan. In terms of our bad guys in the Marauders, you've already mentioned the Humongous, the the leader of the Marauders. He's played by... Kjell Nilsson, who is a Swedish Olympic class weightlifter. Okay. And I was trying to place the accent in my head. Yeah. I was like, where's this guy from? What's really interesting about the character is for a man who is wearing almost nothing the entire film, he he speaks very intelligently at points in time where, yeah. where you almost are like, damn, maybe this guy has a point. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you know, maybe he'll maybe he'll be a good guy, you know? Like maybe maybe if you listen to him, he'll he'll spare everybody. Yeah. And, that... and despite of the fact that he is leading a literal tribe of murderers and rapists and not good people. Ne'er do wells, yeah, yeah. That's the uh So, like, you've probably seen pictures of him online, but yeah, imagine like an eight foot tall bodybuilder wearing like S and M gear and a hockey mask. And mm-hmm. that's Lord humongous is one of the coolest depictions of a villain in film, in my pe- opinion, period. Like just the imagery of this, this guy just, is wild. Just walk away. Yeah. Just, that's not even close to his accent. <laughs> but like, Just walk away. That's not, that's even worse. But yeah, I, I have thoughts on the villains, but that's for later. Cool. The other villain who plays a very big part in this film is the character Wes, who's one of the assless chap uh, marauders who rides a dirt bike or rides a motorcycle with a, another guy behind him who's almost like his gimp kind of thing. His twink. Yeah. yeah he has a very pretty blonde haired yeah. younger man yes. in tow with him. And he is a very interesting character because I hate this man throughout the film. Like he is he's so fun to hate as a character because he's just so comically evil. I have thoughts on the villains, but we should save that for later. But this guy is definitely he's got a very interesting He's also, got like a mohawk, like, and like a red mohawk. Yeah. It's funny that scene where you see the villains and like somebody's like trimming his mohawk yeah. for him. It's like <laughs> oh, we got to get you ready for battle, sweetie. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My favorite part is um, the opening scene. He and his goons are chasing Max, mm-hmm. and Max kind of he manages to like shoot a crossbow through the guy's arm. Yeah, Wes's arm. Wes's arm. Yeah. And then they're kind of facing each other and like nobody's saying or doing anything. So Max just very calmly sets some some bulls and starts like right. collecting the oil. Collecting all the gas. And then Wes just screams at the top of his lungs out of nowhere. And it's just like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you. <laughs> 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 and then he just rides away. It's very, he's very like chaotic evil. Like yes. he seems very like 
you never know what he's going to do next. Yes. And that's what makes him so fun to hate and so enjoyable to watch throughout this film. And he's played by Vernon Wells, which he's actually one of the leads in the movie Commando, which is an Arnold Schwarzenegger film, which I haven't seen that one, actually. Oh, we really? We'll do at some point on this podcast. I haven't seen that well. one either. Is he a bad guy in it? Uh, I don't know. I didn't okay. look that deep. The other kind of two characters that I do kind of want to round out the story or round out the characters that you should know, and no spoilers here, Mike, the feral kid, this is, and the feral kid is one of the more interesting characters in this film as well. There's a lot of interesting characters in this film, to be honest, but the feral kid is like literally a feral child that is with the northern northern tribe he was just kind of found and adopted he doesn't really speak at all during the film yeah he's true feral like nobody bothered teaching him how to talk yeah he just he like crawls through the uh prairie dog like tunnels and he has a cool boomerang that he uses throughout the film and he just kind of makes guttural noises but what I think is really cool about this film, and this is something that I think that Hollywood and and TV really struggle with, is to make children in adult films that are not annoying. And they kind of yeah. nail it with this. Because he's never really the screw-up of the film. Like, he's never really the necessarily comic relief, per se. And he's also like... So, to kind of contextualize this, to bring up of recent, the new Jurassic Park park films a Jurassic world yeah yeah they've kind of especially the first one i honestly haven't seen the second and third one because i was really turned off by the first one but in the original Jurassic park films the adults were the central characters and for some unholy reason in the first of the reboots they made the children the central characters in an adult film and they were annoying as hell and made terrible decisions as an adult, like I don't know, I'm not, I'm put off by that. I don't want to see that. In well, my we films. we hate kids. Let's let it be known <laughs> that here on Vintage Cinema Rewind, we despise children. No, but no, like... but I know what you're saying. Like it's very, um, you know, there's this author I like. His name's Brent Weeks, and um, he wrote this series called the Night Angel Trilogy, where one of the main characters is a he's an immortal assassin who occasionally abuses children. Uh huh. And then he did a sequel series. Well, and he did another series called Lightbringer. And one of the main characters in Lightbringer in the first book is a fat, incompetent, whiny 15-year-old boy. Right. And what's funny is that as readers, you read about this objectively terrible person, this assassin. You're like, whoa, he's so cool. Right. And then you read about this like whiny teenager and you're like, boo, he sucks. Like, yeah. hate this guy. Think- and it's just interesting how like as an audience or as a reader, like it's really easy to make young people extremely annoying. Yes. And extremely unlikable. Yeah. And this film is one of those exceptions where I genuinely like the feral kid and his performance. Think, you know what? I'll say it. I'll say it. I'll say it. I'll just say it. Okay? Say it. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Uh, Carl, think Carl from season one and two of The Walking Dead. Annoying as shit. Everyone wanted to die Carl to like Carl in the later seasons where you were like, this is my guy. And if he dies, I will stop watching. And I did stop watching. Spoilers. Spoilers. I've never seen The Walking Dead. Um, I don't know who you're talking about, but I agree with you. <laughs> Carl! Yeah. You know the meme. I do know the meme. Uh, uh, the last character I want to mention from the Northern Tribe is the Warrior Woman, actually, who is just a really cool, badass character in the film. She's definitely one of the lead of the this little military unit in, in the group, and I just really like her performance. She killed it. Yeah. I will say, um, this is a very charming movie. Mm-hmm. Like, it almost kind of reminded me of Die Hard in the sense that, like, it's not like an... Well, okay, like, it's funny. Like, right. it's actually, considering how, like, bleak the world is, it's a, like, shockingly funny movie. Yeah. Like, um, even just little things. Like, there's a scene where, like, Max is being chased by bad guys, and he drives by the camp, and, like, the wind from his car, like, throws a tent aside where two bandits were having sex. Right. Like, just little things like that. Or, right. like, there's a scene where, so there's this um mechanic who, like, has to be kind of moved around on a crane because his legs are broken and there's a scene where like him and this guy are shouting directions back and yes, forth <laughs> that's one of my favorite scenes of the whole yeah, movie yeah yeah it's 
And even like the gyro captain himself, like everything that guy says is a gem. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> he's just spitting one liners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, Oh god, remember lingerie? <laughs> like, <laughs> It's like, this is a very, like, like, everyone does a good job, and this is a very, like, again. You can tell that everybody there making this film was incredibly passionate about the film that they were making. Yeah. And everybody was on board with making this, like, a a fun, serious, bleak, but also somewhat comedic film. Like, everybody understood the tone on set. Yeah, and I mean, I was kind of thinking, like, watching this movie... Recently, I was thinking, like, have I not watched this movie before? Because this is almost the perfect Mike movie. Because, yeah. like, I've talked before about how I like things that are extremely depressing, but also really silly at the same time. Right. And this is that movie. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. We'll talk George Miller, to the director, a little bit now. He he actually started his career as an emergency room doctor in Sydney. Okay. Um, And pivoted into films. He'd actually, because of being an emergency room doctor, he'd actually seen a lot of car accidents, injuries, and deaths. And Interesting. And so he incorporated a lot of that into the first movie and i don't know how much of the the car injuries really play out in the second movie as much in the first movie they're really apparent but i think it's really cool to see where he came from and his understanding of of people's bodies and and injuries and and traumatic injuries and and how how dangerous a vehicle can be right yeah and definitely it, like this is the other shout out that i wanted to give here is that you got to give a shout out to the stunt men and women oh, yeah. on set of this film. Like their jobs were incredibly difficult and they like some of them did sacrifice their bodies in this film. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about. There's a there's a couple shots in this movie where I'm just like, I'm pretty sure that guy's dead. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure that is a corpse on screen. This is this is a time in film history when CGI did not exist. And no. people put their bodies on the line for our viewing for our entertainment <laughs> yeah. yeah and and so george miller comes into this with a lot of that knowledge and expertise and 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 i think that without him on set i think that things a could have gone really wrong on set of this film and b like he he just brings a very interesting perspective to this film that i really appreciated yeah what's really cool about the history of this film and and george miller as a director is he actually turned down directing first blood to make mad max 2 good choice yes because first blood <laughs> turned out pretty okay by whoever directed it yeah yeah and and mad max is kind of his like his baby it's like it's the rocky series to sylvester stallone whereas like the mad max series like george miller actually finished the first mad max movie and because of all the restraints to the budget and he didn't have a lot of control over the creative process either necessarily he left that film wanting more and this was the more that we got and then you know later on we get fury road which is like all of the more you'll ever know oh mad yeah max like fury road is a miracle like yes, in every sense and what's really cool about George Miller reading into him is after the first Mad Max movie, he just decided, you know what, I need to be the guy in control. And so if you look at his filmography, he often writes, directs, and produces all of his films and is often very present in the editing room as well for everything. I believe it. Yeah. So the other films that he directed and wrote and produced are Mad Max Fury Road, Happy Feet 1 and 2, Nice. Babe, Babe Pig in the City. Really? And 3,000 okay. Years of Longing. Yeah. He. What's really cool about George Miller is he makes like very adult films and films that are a part of my childhood <laughs> and were very important to my childhood. The guy like, has range. You got to give him that. Yeah. He's a very, very good director that should be potentially talked about in like greatest of all times. Like not the greatest of all time, but he's up there. Oh, yeah. Like he's got to be up there. You don't just direct Mad Max 2 and Fury Road and not be in that discussion. Right. And Happy Feet was one of the biggest films of like the mid 2000s. I'm pretty sure it was the success of Happy Feet that got him the funding to make mad max i think you're right yes <laughs> so if you next time you are watching fury road just think about dancing penguins <laughs> <laughs> um who this movie is for so we've already kind of touched on this a little bit but 
this is a film with a lot going on. Like, it's in a post-apocalyptic action film. It's a genre film. It's a little comedic. Like, it takes a lot of inspiration from westerns, from road movies, from action movies leading up to this point in time. It's it's a film that has really widespread appeal. Like, this is a really solid movie because it's so goddamn exciting. It's, it's paced extraordinarily well. It's a classic good versus evil film while also including a found family element to it right it's almost kind of similar this might be a stretch it's almost kind of similar to like the first star wars movie no it's it's very much in line with that i would like, agree like that's just, the that's the film that i did could think about when i was thinking about films that were similar just in the sense that like it's kind of got this very kind of simple fairy tale core yeah. underneath it all well this very simple story there's that and the other element as well is the character of Max Rokotansky. Yeah. He's somewhere in the same ballpark as like a John Wick or Han Solo kind of character. Yeah. And and Han Solo was one that really bounced around my head while I was watching it on this watch. <laughs> What's funny, I was actually looking it up. He's got like I don't think this guy says like 30 words in the whole movie. Very, very few he words. He does have he has very little to say. Which is very similar to the John Wick series, right? Like also I'm that. pretty sure in the three hour John Wick four film, John Wick says like hundred and fifty eight words or hundred and fifty eight lines or something like that. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So if you like those films and like that kind of protagonist and, and that kind of stylized film, then you're really gonna love this one and I can't recommend it enough for you. Yeah, like I actually wrote that down. Mel Gibson only has 16 lines of dialogue in the entire film. Oh my God. And two of them are, I only came for the gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been a, okay. Here's the only thing. I like, I've been, I've kind of been hyping this up a lot, but uh, there are a couple trigger warnings to this film. This film is extraordinary violent. It's yeah. depiction of evil groups of people. Like, it goes out there like it it shows you pretty pretty terrible things like there's a, a full-on rape scene that happens the dog does die in this film um, yeah that's which, sad yeah which always upsets people however i do have a positive note to that i was reading about this and i thought you know what dog dies always turns people off but positive to the story in the real life the dog was actually rescued from a local dog pound and was going to be euthanized and said they made him a star yeah and they made him a star and afterwards one of the camera operators adopted him oh and, and he was never in another film again because he lived happily ever after with his camera operator buddy buddy that's cute yeah it's a, the dog is actually a pretty good actor yeah surprisingly for a dog that was just pulled out of a local dog pound like this dog was definitely given a new life and forever just immortalized in in this film yeah and like he didn't know he was being recorded he didn't know this was a movie he thought he was just <laughs> hanging out with his buddy max <laughs> yeah and his, and his buddy uh the gyro the captain. gyro captain yeah <laughs> he actually apparently uh he was really the dog was very fond of the gyro captain throughout the film so like the gyro captain had to like play with him to like make the dog seem like it was more nasty than it was <laughs> kind of thing so <laughs> that's really that's really sweet yeah <laughs> So just a couple trigger But I love there. you. Yeah. And and kind of because this film, like this film comes at a really cool time in Hollywood as well because it's a very aggressive film honestly as well. Like it's it's kind of got this like post 70s exploitation kind of aggression to it. Um the, like this grittiness. Yeah, like there's a lot of nudity, there's sex, there's really horrible rape and violence and stuff like that in this film and so it fits in this weird category of films where you can't really show it to your kids yeah so it's like original star wars if it was rated r yeah yeah and so like if obi-wan cut more people's arms off yeah it's like not really a film that you can show your kids per se but like you almost have to let them find it but like it's worth finding it's worth you know like maybe tossing a little humongous somewhere in your household to like make your kids be like someday when i'm an adult yeah. i'm gonna watch him <laughs> and then you can be like just walk away <laughs> just walk away <laughs> no then when your kids start struggling you can like hold the, like hug them slash choke hold them until they calm down yeah who else would you recommend this movie to uh this is oh man this is such a boring answer because it's what i always say but like if you're interested in the history of cinema this is a really good 
read or read this is a really good watch if you're interested in the history of cinema also like this might sound weird but like if you're a gamer and you like the fallout series this is almost an official fallout adaptation yeah and the borderlands series even essentially like i was actually it's funny we were watching um castle in the sky a couple weeks ago and i was saying like wow it's astonishing like how much video games like elden ring right dark souls took from this watching mad max i'm like wow like fallout took so much from these movies the legacy of this game of this movie is so massive to 80s action and beyond films and video games and everything like this film it just has such a cool aesthetic at all of the time and it's just like banging you over the head with just like cool costume design and cool cars and like cool set pieces and it's hard not to understand why this film is such a cultural staple Again, similar to Castle in the Sky, like it's almost like the world kind of takes center stage even more so than the characters or the story. Mm-hmm. It's like this whole movie is like an its own aesthetic or like yeah. its own vibe. Yeah, and it really stands alone in that sense. Like, And what's cool is every Mad Max film itself is kind of unique in its own in its own way right like yeah uh, kind of to compare fury road like Fer- fury road is like a it's almost like cultish in in a sense and like all of the characters at that point in time are are larger in life but all of the marauders and maybe we'll talk about this in more detail but the the marauders feel like an assortment of different groups of horrible human beings brought together under lord humongous and every one of them like there's there'll be like several of one group that'll have a very unique aesthetic to the several of another group and like everybody within that group even has their own has their own imagery and 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 vehicle and everything else and style and it's really cool how it all fits together yeah yeah definitely when to watch this is a big blockbuster movie the sound the score of this movie is phenomenal which we'll talk about later as with all car movies the better your sound is the better your experience is gonna be just jack up the volume and and get ready for a ride yeah don't watch this movie on your phone like watch it on an actual tv yeah watch it or on a laptop like i did but (laughs) with the sound cranked up to 11 there you go yeah, I, I think this is a great Saturday night watch and, and watch with other people because it's a really fun one. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. Like, it's a movie that's meant to be experienced with others. Yeah. We've been talking about Star Wars and John Wick a lot. It's like, can you imagine how sad it would be to watch those movies by yourself? <sighs> no, go watch them with other people. Yeah, I very much agree. Um, Where to watch, unfortunately, not streaming anywhere. The very first movies on Tubi, if you're one of the very niche people who fits with that film, I don't think many people are going to connect with that one. Fury Road's on Netflix, though, which is cool. It is. That's where I watched it. Yeah. So you can watch Fury Road on Netflix and then, you know, go your way to check this one out because it's really worth your time, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And that concludes our primer spoiler free as possible episode so go check this one out and come back next week and get dive in headlong into all of the spoiler discussion behind the scenes and all the other cool stuff we got witness me (laughs) (laughs) nice 